Thank you for joining us to our eChurch family, MFM family, our friends around the world. We love you. God bless you. Now you know this is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And I know, Pastor, they are already glad because they are tuning into this service. God bless you. Bless you. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to go to Matthew's Gospel in the sixth chapter, and I want to look at verse 30 down to verse 34. Really, the subject matter in that particular context of Matthew and Jesus speaking about worry and concern starts around verse 22 or 23, but I'm going to cut to the idea of the text. I'm going to pick it up from the New King James Version, <clears throat> and bear with me as I move through this message. I pray that it ministers to someone's heart, and even you that are on each church and that the word of the Lord will find you where you're at and strengthen you in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> in Matthew Gospel 6, chapter verse 30 to 34. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall I eat and what shall I drink? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all, I need 50 people to say all, all. these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is, is its own trouble. And all the people said amen. <clears throat> Some might say God is in control. And that's my message for you this morning. And you that are watching by each church, I want to send you a word of confidence and assurance that God is in control. In this verse, that seek ye first the kingdom of God, the 33rd verse of the 6th chapter of Matthew, uh, the writer here, Christ is speaking or looking back to Proverbs, the 3rd chapter in verse 6, where the wisdom of Solomon was saying, in all thy ways acknowledge him, God, and he shall direct your path. An easy read uh, version, which I'm getting accustomed to look at because it just sounds like a newspaper, but um, I like the King James, it got some bite to it. But anyway, the easy read says like this, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And the Message Bible goes on and it says, listen for God's, listen for God's voice in everything you do. Whatever you, wherever you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. All your ways acknowledge him. I need God to help me to keep my path straight. I need him to direct my path and to keep me on track. I have a tendency to not walk a straight line. It seems like I thought I was walking straight before I know it, I started veering off into something else. The text has given us an insight of this subject this morning. God is in control. It is a trusting God. But I must ask myself some questions. I would like for you to consider these questions with me. Of life's concern, if I'm going to trust God, is God really in control? How much control does God really have? If he is not in complete control, then who is and what is in control? How can I learn to trust God and know that he is in control and rest in that? Now, it's a lot of questions, but I don't know all the, what you're thinking about. But if anybody I want to be in control is God, I want him to be in full control. The last question of thought is that if, if I'm going to learn it, how to trust God and know that he's in control, I must rest in that. <clears throat> I must learn how to trust him and rest in that. Before we get a complete answer, I want to say this emphatically. You can't trust somebody you don't know. And the problem with most believers is that you don't really know the God you're serving. So you don't really have a great trust or faith of confidence in him. Don't worry, I'll get better out of the argument, but I'm going to set you up. You know someone that you have to trust them. 
years ago, back in the early, late 70s, 78, somewhere in there, I was in Dayton, Ohio, and I had to get back home up to Fresno, California, and I, um, it was a very big storm that was going on, but the pilot said that we can get you over to Columbus. I said, well, how far is the flight? He says, 38 minutes. You go, before you get up, you're coming down. That's an easy flight. Going to the airport, my grandfather's dropped me off. <clears throat> I could see the lightning shattering. The thunder was coming down. I said, oh, it's going to be an easy flight. It won't be take that long. Went on to the airport, got on the plane, sat down, and the pilot says, it may be some turbulence when we take off. I said to myself, then let me fly. So the plane took off, and before we knew it, it was like a kike in the wind. The plane was just bouncing like a ball all over the place. I said, have we reached the altitude yet to start coming down? I said, not yet, we're still going up. Sweat, everybody on the plane was grabbing the leather. The fingers are going down into the seat and the armrest. 38 minutes, we did not miss a bump for 38 minutes. Just poop, 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 poop. And I started getting nervous. Everybody was grabbing paper bags and just wondering, maybe I might use this, maybe I won't. I'm nervously sitting there and I'm, I'm just getting very, very stunned down. Like, this ain't gonna work. Lord Jesus, you know, you, you're, in, you're ever flowing the plane with turbulence. Start speaking in tongues under your breath. Yes. <clears throat> Pi there was a pilot sitting next to me. He says, looks like you're worried, young man. I said, I am drastically worried. Is this plane gonna la land? He says, there's a 37% chance that this plane will land and there's a 38% on the ground that a crash will happen. I said, really? Right now, I feel like this plane gonna crash. He said, no, this plane's gonna last. It's, it's, it land, it's, it's designed to land. I said, okay, but I'm going from Dayton to Columbus, but I gotta go from Columbus to the West Coast. When the plane landed and we pulled up, I said, thank you, Jesus, we're on the ground. But my thought was, we gotta go up again. And then this pilot says that we're gonna get out of the turbulence real soon, it's gonna be a smooth flight. Easy for him to say he was flying the plane. I was not in control. The pilot was in control. Trusting that he knew what he was doing, how to fly in a storm, he did very well from Dayton to Columbus. And the other pilot did well from Columbus to the West Coast. You're not in control. And you're gonna hit a whole lot of turbulence as you move along with Jesus. But you can rest assured you will land safely at the destination he has planned. I must answer myself these questions and know that I know God, I know his word, and that he is in control. The thing that settles me down, and I've grown over the years to understand, to know that God is in control is a word called sovereignty. It is God's sovereignty. There's a great strength and confidence in knowing that God has a plan and I'm a part of that plan. God's sovereignty is defined in a complete understanding that my dependence is not independent, but is dependent on him. That he is in control of every circumstance and every moment in history. God is in control of every circumstance and every moment in history. I said God is in control of every circumstance and every moment in history. Psalms 24 and 1, the NIV says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalms 24 and 1. It's the Lord's earth. God left man here in charge. We know that of Genesis 1, 26, and gave man to have dominion over the earth and to till it and to take care of it and be a steward. But it's still God's world. Man has a responsibility and man must take responsibility for his responsibility. Dominion over the earth. Every creeping thing, things of the fish, of the sea, man is in control of the things of the earth but God is in control of this world. The Bible says in, Genesis, in Psalms 8 and 6 that God made man to have dominion and to rule over the works of his hand. And with great authority, man must take this responsibility on like one would own or have a pet. It's easy to say, I want one, but there's a governmental concern to make sure you look out for this animal properly. If not, there's a governmental rule that's illegal if you do not treat this animal right. If no one else sees, the animal rights people will. Because there's a responsibility to be a steward over whatever is in your care. Still, it is God's world. Second Chronicles 20 and 6 NIV. God who is in the heavens, you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. I can sit down right there. To know that he has all authority over everything 
and there's no one that can withstand him. Isaiah 40, 24, let me lay it out more to you. And he says there in the NIV, the Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purpose, so it will happen. I'm working my plan, Clinton, and it's going to be according to what I say. Daniel 2, 21 and 22 says it like this. He changes or he devises or alters time and seasons. He removes a king and raises up another king. You saw that a few weeks ago. God is even saying who's going to bleed, even though man is trying to manipulate it. Aren't you glad that God is moving the hearts of man? He determines also and he gives knowledge or he gives power to those who have understanding or discernment. He rules in Daniel's there that's in that second chapter. Daniel says he reveals the deep and secret things. That's God. He'll tell you what's really going on. God is in control. And I just laid some scriptures to your heart to show you by the Bible that he is in control. When God is in control, it gives me a sense of security. The greatest instinct in any animal or human being is need, need is security, especially in the midnight hour when you sleep and don't know who's walking through your yard. You need a sense of resting security that God is in control. The quality of the state of being secure is security, it's freedom from danger and fear or anxiety. If I lose this job, God will give me another job. If I lose this house, God will give me another house. If I lose this car, God will get me another car. But security and safety are somewhat of a difference. Ellen Ryan says it like this. The term security and safety is often used to inter interchangeably. However, while they are close linked, they are most, most certainly different. Understanding the difference of security and safety is like having an umbrella. An umbrella is the key here that will keep us safe from being wet and being on, on, in the rain. And that safety gives me a safeguard. So God is in control. He is a safeguard to my mind and to everything that's going on around me. So I don't have to worry because he is running the show. And I'm a part of the plan of what he is doing. Security, security and safeguard were challenged many times as we in life we have securities, but sometimes our security is, is interrupted by our choices. Choices, choices, choices. God's in control, but I feel a security, but I got to make a choice now. Which job should I take? Which business shall I start? What school or university shall I attend? Which car should I buy? Should I ask her to marry me? Or should I just DM him and give him a suggestion? Are you ready for another baby? Which house should I buy? Should I keep looking for another house? What bill should I pay or not pay? Choices that interrupts my security. Or should I not pay them at all and make excuses? Do I mend this or do I end this? Do I take the vaccine or do I pass? Aura, aura, aura. Choices. Do I go back to church or should I stay at home and become an e-church member forever? Do I stay locked up in this house, in this place, in my personal palace? Or do I get up out of here and realize that God has not given me the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind? Life is full of choices. Being binary as we are, we can vote between one or the other thing if it's just two things to move on. But if it's various things to move on, then we sometimes get confused and decide what to do. For instance, standing in a, in a rising water, we're about to drown. Someone says, jump on the rock. I can jump on the rock. But if I'm standing in the drowning water and someone says, you can jump on the rock, grab the rope, or cr cr climb the tree, someone I'm going to get mixed up not knowing what choice to make. But I have to make a choice and a quick decision. In the middle of all of my decisions and all my choices, I'm so glad that God is still sovereign. His grace and mercy still guides us to control every event of our life. Romans 8, 28, and New King James Version said like this. He said that all things are working together for the good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. It's key to understand the text that we're looking at this morning and see it in a different paradigm with me. The sixth chapter of Matthew really gives an overview of priority and faith. 
setting my priorities right, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added to you. And my faith here is in the picture. It's beautiful to see that God cares about his creation. Birds and flowers and lilies and fields. God is a great carekeeper. Even today, tomorrow, these things that you see grow up, they're thrown into the oven and burnt up and gone away, but God still looks out for his creation. In sixth chapter of Matthew, he brings Solomon into picture and says, Solomon was not even glorious as all of these things that I have made. Have you ever drove in the desert where we live in springtime, looked across the field and see the beautiful wildflowers just breaking up out the ground? No farmer, no tilling, only God's rain and nutrients that made these flowers come back up in their own beauty. And God takes care of these things, takes care of these lilies. Lilies. Solomon, of all of his glory, sees his great temple. And Solomon builds this wonderful palace of all these maidservants and cupbearers. has all the, these wonderful jubilee columns. He has all this marble floor, everything, silver cups. He said, but all of this that Solomon had and made was not as beautiful as one of my flowers. As anything that I have made. My creation is beautiful all by itself. And he says, it's my desire also to look out for you. The human nature of us is to make sure that we look our best and be our best. And God is resting a claim on this. He said, you are more valuable than all these things I made. If I made them look good, guess what? You're going to look good too. I'm going to work within your life to bring about a beauty that you have not thought I can tap into. We've seen the fires of California and seen them burn up the hillsides and leave it blacked and scorched where everything is gone. Soon, you see somebody climbing the hillside, planting new seeds to bring up new trees, but God was already ahead of them. Blowing from another tree to drop seeds on the ground to bring trees back up on ravines and gorges that they could not get down in. When man mess everything up, God comes in and clean it up very well. Your life may be a mess right now. You may have jacked it up as much as you can, but I know God is in control. He can turn around and clean your life up again and make it even so beautiful. So beautiful that when the queen of Sheba went to Solomon and all that he had, she said the half, First Kings, this 10th chapter in verse 7, she said the half has not been told. I believe and I prophesy before this year is over, somebody going to see you and say the half has not been told. I know God is controlling your life. I know God is keeping you because what they said you were not going to do, God did it anyway. Out of all the ruins you've gone through, you still have the resiliency to come back. The half has not been told. So beautiful was the creations of God and beautiful the things of Solomon. But Jesus says that, listen, you church are more valuable than sparrows and flowers and lilies. You're more better than that. I'm going to look out for you specifically. But I don't need you to worry. I don't want you to sit around and become worrisome, encumbered and filled with anxiety. Jesus here is teaching us from the example of things that he has promised. I promise to assure you I'll supply all these things, but don't worry. It's dangerous to worry. Worry will damage your health. It will disrupt your, your productivity. Worry, worry will bring such a negativity and effects upon you that you'll start lashing out at other people. Reduce your ability even to trust God. I don't need you worrying. So the question this morning is, how may, how may I then be effective? How may I not worry, especially at the time like this, expressing how, what I'm going to, how can I not worry? I just told you God looked out for flowers. He looks out for birds. Not one will fall to the ground that he doesn't know about. And he said that you are more valuable than a bird and valuable than a flower. Or grass tomorrow is thrown into the oven, it's gone. He said, and your body is more than what you can put on. Remember, there is a difference between worrying and genuine concern. Worry immobilizes you, but concern moves you into action. Maybe God is trying to get you to take some actions and not worry about what you cannot change. Don't limit, he says, me to you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. It is something that when God doesn't move like you think he should move, then the subjects start coming out. Well, maybe God can't do it. Oh, no. There's nothing too hard for my God. So don't limit him to your little faith. That he can only give you food, clothes, and some water. He's bigger than that. He's greater than that. And he's got more to give you than the little that you're asking him for. He can clothe you, but he can also advance you. And build you to a platform that you never thought you would come to. 
Look at God. Look how he is beautifying the saints and beautifying the church. We are his masterpiece. Genesis 1, 27, made in his image and likeness. We are the express image of God. He made them both male and female. Told them to be fruitful and multiply. You can only multiply with a male. Get back to your message, son. Get back to your message. Remember, you are dip, drop, dead, gorgeous. Say, I am. Dip, drop dead, drop a lot, gorgeous. And the half has not been told. Pick up the pace, Clinton. You have not seen the best you yet. Even out of all the stuff you got in your closet, you ain't seen the best you yet. I feel 50 people in here on an upgrade right now. That's why you've been cleaning out your closet for stuff probably... But God is getting you ready for something better. He always makes room for more. That's the life that you live when you serve a God that's not broke. He is in full control. He wants us to stay focused then. In all their ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Make your path straight or keep you on track. Jesus is teaching the disciples here again of Solomon's wisdom. Teaching us how to look to the value of our priorities. What really means most to us? What value do we value things? What value do we value things? Where is God on your list? And what has he done? What has he done to advance you? Make you vital. Make you vital and partner with him in everything you do. Make sure God's a part of your, your specific and your complete plan. Jesus is exalting them to take no thought again, verse 32, about what you're going to eat. Don't be careful about these things. It's a tough message because I know you're thinking about things that I'm not thinking about, but I'm talking about grass, I'm talking about birds, I'm talking about lilies, and you're more valuable than them. Who gives you this assurance? God does. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, verse 33 of Matthew 6, he says all these things, the kingdom of God is the rule of God. All these things will be added to you, added to your life. These things are going to be added on to whatever else I'm going to do to show you how I'm in control. Let tomorrow care for itself. The old English would say sufficient for today is the evil thereof. The modern English would say enough for today for today's own problems. It's enough to get through the day than to put my mind on tomorrow. I'm concerned about what God is doing right now. Continuing today, continuing today to make my mind focus on the things of God. Once I put my mind continuous on the things of today, it takes me away from the anxiety for tomorrow. It's one day at a time and just keep it simple to keep knowing that if God can get me through this day, then I know he's got a plan for tomorrow because God is in control. I want you to maintain your faith. As I come to my close this morning, he's telling them, I want you to maintain your faith. Oh, you of little faith. Maintain your faith in the midst of disaster, in the midst of depression, in the midst of challenging time. Maintain your faith and trust me. Trust me. Fully understand that you can follow my instruction. If God is in control, then I'm going to see what he's got to say about it before I throw in the towel. Before I give up and start worrying about what I'm going to get to tomorrow, I'm going to let God do what he's going to do today. Look around then and see the world that we live in. Everybody ain't broke. Somebody's building all over town. People are buying things. People are flying all over the world. You might be going through right now, but God's about to make you more beautiful than ever before. You're just having a hard patch right here, but God can get you through it and bring you out on the other side. You can be more wonderfully a testimony for him after what you've gone through. Don't throw away all the ashes. Save some of the ashes. Let the devil know, yes, you hit me, but I came through it. And God got me out just on time. God, God, God is in control. There's a story in the book of 1 Kings I want to allude to before I quit. He says in 1 Kings in the 17th chapter, and Jesus is speaking, and I'm sorry, the, I, Elijah is speaking here and talking about the story of the woman of Zarephath. The prophet Elijah comes to her and she comes to him, says, I only have a handful of flour. I only have a little oil in the jar. And I'm getting ready to get some sticks and I'm starting and I'm going to prepare a fire and I'm going to prepare this meal for me and my son and then we're going to eat it and die. You see how you begin to think when you don't put God in the equation. First thing that comes in that I'm not going to ever make it out of this. And death start talking to you and saying that we're going to take you out. But God, I'm so glad 
that God is even in control of death. Death got to get an appointment before he stops by the believer's house. Death cannot just come in an abrupt way and say, I'm going to just take a life. No, it's got to talk to God because you belong to God, not UMC. You belong to God. And I thank God that he is in control of death, only using it as a tool for transition until we get back to glory. And after everything has been swallowed up, the last enemy he's going to destroy is the enemy of death. Do you see the picture? I'm going to hit death so hard, he's going to wish he never was in the picture and on the wrong side of the battle. The woman begins to talk about dying and began to get depressed because of what she's going through. This world can depress you if you look at it through the wrong picture. We see a lot of things that's coming down the road. It's making us feel worrisome and worried. But God says, I'm in control. And that's what you ought to put your faith on this morning. Elijah begins to address her worries. He said, listen, woman, I understand you got a concern here. And where are you getting ready to die? He said, but the prophet says to her, he says, do not fear. Let me just tell somebody, wherever you at this morning, don't fear because God is in control. Don't let fear start making you shake, making you feel like it ain't going to turn out the way God wants it to turn out. He's planned it all from the beginning. I don't want you talking about dying and talking about death, disaster and disappointment. Don't fear. Don't let that talk come out your mouth. Matter of fact, if you get around somebody talking like that, tell them just hold what you're saying. I got to go and find somebody that's talking about God is in control. I know that things are behind. I know that things are late, but I'm so glad that God is in control. No more disaster. Quit talking that disaster stuff and that down stuff and, and depressed stuff. God's controlling your life. I just told you five minutes ago, he looked at lilies and flowers and birds. He's taking care of those things. Surely he can take care of you. Look at you. As much as you think you don't have it going on, God still got his hand on your life. As much as the enemy wants to get to you, God's still directing your life. He is in control. He is Addresses the woman's concerns now. He act, he concerns our actions, needing to make this cake for her and her son. He says to her, Woman, go and do as you have said. You got the right mindset to keep on eating something to sustain your life. But make me a curd cake first and bring me some, then take some to your son. You, so your son, you should know the story. Uh, Dr. House did a wonderful job with it, but I want to show you here about God being in control. When you're down to your little, God can control your little. When, when, when you're down to just a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal and just a last meal, God can control your little if you give it to him. If you give him your little, he'll give you a whole lot back. That's the kind of God that we serve that's in control. Today, I'm telling somebody to know for, doubt, know for a doubt without certain, with, a, with certainty that when you're facing situations that you don't know what to do with it, turn it over to the Lord. The Lord God of Israel says the bins of flour shall not waste. They will not go out. I promise you, you will always have a supply. You're going to always have something. That's the stuff you stand up and shout about. I ain't got a job, but God says he will supply me another job. I may not have the same car I had. I'm riding with somebody else, but God said he'll supply another car. I may not have the things that I desire right now, but God is a supplier. Because if you put it in God's hand, that little he'll control and bring back a whole lot. Today, I decree, I am seeking after him with my whole heart. Lord, you said if I seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all these things shall be added unto me. So I declare this morning an intentional search. I'm searching through prayer. I'm searching through the word. I'm looking high and low for the promises of God. I'm looking for the assurance of the word of God, the God that cannot lie. Lord, what are you searching for, Clinton? I'm searching for you to be who you are. God in control. 
watch me this morning catch the text the man didn't say Jesus didn't say seek for a car seek for a house seek for a wife seek for money seek for things no put your priorities back on me if you seek me you'll find me everything you need I have I will give all these things unto you all things are possible to them that believe God is adding to your life right now don't hate me because I'm blessed like that because I'm not seeking things I'm seeking the God that can give things I decree according to Daniel 11 32 I am the people that know my God I'm not somebody trying to figure God out but I know my God he is in control the more it seems out of control then I know God is in control somebody holler take the wheel Jesus I need you to drive this thing don't let me mess it up any longer let me see your people doing great exploits fulfilling your plans according to Jeremiah 29 11 I know the plans I have of you declares the Lord plans up to purpose you plans to not harm you plans to give you hope and a future God has a plan he's working that plan because God is in control listen church before I go to my seat have you not known have you not heard the creator the ends of the earth the eternal God faileth not there is no search into his understanding his ways are past finding out God that made the world and everything in it is looking out for you what is man that you are so mindful of him and the son of man that you will visit him that's my baby that's my girl that's my child I gotta make her beautiful I gotta build him back up life has knocked you down problems have ran you over but God is in control don't let the devil or nobody else tell you anything different God's got your best interest he's working it out for your good put your hands together and give God a praise in this house he's in control bow your heads hold your hands up father in the name of Jesus I speak to the atmosphere I speak a word to the airways we seek you this morning from the bottom of our heart we put forth an intentional search to find you in our reach now God show your hand show forth your mercy show your sovereign grace build up the brokenhearted strengthen the faith of the belief in the name of Jesus Heavenly Father I submit to your will this is not a plan to destroy me. This has been a plan to advance me. You're working in this storm. Yes, Lord. You're working right now in the midst of this heartache. Yes, Lord. Satan, I serve you notice. Mm. You are not in control of my affairs. My God. Satan, you do not control the destiny of my life. Satan, you are not dictating the movement of what I'm going through. God is using every moment to work for my good because he is in control. Give God an in control praise. Hallelujah. I said, come on, get on your feet. Give God a, you're in control praise. Come on, come on, rise on your feet. Give God a clap and a shout. Hallelujah. You are in control. You are fully in control. Hallelujah.